I don't care about titles. All anymore. right. And welcome back, everyone. We are now doing the uh, Silver Sponsor Tier Sessions. And thank you all so, so very much for, for joining us here. And to Zybex for being a Silver Sponsor. Appreciate it more than you know. We wouldn't be able to do everything that we're doing if it wasn't for you and the rest of the sponsors. So thank you so, so very much. And uh, today, for this session, this session is going to be Dispatch Furniture Projects, Managing a Remodel or New Build. And my guest here for their presentation is going to be Ken Carson. He's the owner and vice president of Zybex, also Doug Herman, VP of sales and marketing, um, and then Heather Brown, North Regional Sales Manager. Thank you all for joining us and uh, take it away. Well, hey everybody, as you found out, my name is Ken Carson, one of the owners here at Zybex, and uh, I've got my crew with me here, obviously Heather and Doug, it's pretty easy to tell which one's which. And uh, we've been, well, one cool thing that's coming up here is June 26th, our um, Zybex will be 30 years old. So we're really excited for that. Um, almost all of that we've concentrated and specialized in this 911 market. So we really enjoy it. We love the people we work with them. Uh, we like serving you guys who serve others. And that's one of our values. Um, but what we see out there a lot is one of the most daunting things out there, um, just behind staffing probably is you get money or you know you need to get an update to your room and furniture oftentimes comes along with cat or radio or things like that so it gets gets more complicated and every now and then you get a chance to do this twice in your career but a lot of times when we come in it's going to be your first time because you've taken years to become director level you want to manage this thing well you're not going to get to do it again well we've done thousands of these but what I've decided to do differently here today um, is we're going to, you guys are going to watch a video that we put together and we interviewed our customers at manager level, supervisor, director level. So we've got people with legacy experience that have done this multiple times. One example here, you see Terry Hall out of York County, Virginia, and I think he's done six or seven uh, buildings, remodels, things like that. So he knows how to make these projects run smoothly. So you're going to hear it from them, not from us. And so you sit back and enjoy this. Now, I think the advantage of watching something that's pre-recorded is we're going to be able to use the chat window on the right-hand side, and you guys can chat and ask us questions, and we will, we'll be able to be a little more responsive and help you out with anything as you go along. So don't hesitate to use the chat window. You can bug Heather if you like, bug Doug, bug me, whatever you want to do, ask us fun questions. We're here to help out with everything. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand it back over to Ricardo, and he's going to start the video here in just a couple of seconds. Hello there, I'm Ken Carson, one of the owners at Zybex, and we put together this video for you to learn about the process of getting a new center, remodeling, updating. So we're gonna go into some details with this. We're gonna talk about paint colors, layout, how to go shop for furniture, what to look for, what questions to ask other 911 centers and what they have. The cool part about this is it's from your colleagues, it's from directors that have years and years of experience that can help guide you through this pathway. So. Let's get started right away and we're going to learn a little bit about their previous centers they are in, their previous rooms, and how they moved on. Tell me a little bit about your previous center, the previous room you're in, and because I know it's a massive change to what you have here. It really is. Uh, 1983, uh, Lafayette started its 911 with the director then, Mr. Bill Vincent. Okay. And um, it was in the basement of the courthouse. We have a, a seven-story courthouse and uh, they had a basement down there. It actually was a bomb shelter. Okay, okay when it was originally uh, built. Yeah. And they kind of tried to retrofit 911 there. And you know they did what they can. It was the, the space that was available at the time. And all throughout the years, they kind of continued to retrofit uh, that building. Actually, total of uh, 38 years was spent there. Wow. Right. Um, we were very fortunate. The director at the time, the board members, and the staff realized they saw Lafayette growing, realized the, um, the expansion that it had, and knew that a new building was going to be needed. Uh, many years ago, they started saving money. They called it a future projects fund. Okay. And they, every year, they would put money into that. And 2015, Mr. Vincent had retired. Uh, I was hired as a director, and that was one of the projects they, uh, they had on the table. They wanted to get this building built, said, we have the funds available to do that and you know, gave me uh, that project. You've been at this for a while. Uh, how many 911 centers have you remodeled or built over time here? Uh, in this facility, I think this is like the fourth or fifth time. 
and we do some things regional as well. So uh, this is probably like number seven or eight total. Okay, now see, so you've got some experience and I wanna, I wanna ask you some questions about that. This project is a live cutover. Tell me a little bit about the live cutover and then anything, any advice you'd have for uh, other 911 centers uh, and what they can do in a live cutover to make it go smoothly. So live cutovers are a lot of fun, but it takes a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. And the way that you have to plan this out, you have to you know, just plan for the worst and hope for the best. You bring all the vendors together, you make sure everyone understands their roles and responsibilities. You know, uh, there's about 11 vendors that worked on this product. Mm -hmm. So not only did we upgrade our furniture, we upgraded a lot of our uh, Motorola equipment that we have in there at the time. We put in some new alarm systems. We put in new key fob system, a new intercom system. Yep. So we had to do this. It's almost like playing dominoes. When you push the first domino, you've passed the point of no return. Ours was particularly interesting because we did it live and we split the room in half. And we provide backup communications for multiple jurisdictions. So we needed to make sure that we maintained that capability throughout. Again, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So we cut our room in half and we got all the vendors together and every day we started off with a pep talk and every evening we looked to make sure, make sure that we had the milestones. We only had a few days worth of time frame built in here for errors and if we were running behind on something, we put in the, the manpower and the extra hours and we made it happen to get, uh, to get caught up. If not, those dominoes quit rolling and at the end of it, you're gonna be a week, two weeks behind and you're gonna have some of your technology not up and operational. I was here a couple years ago and I was at your old center. So tell people about your old center because I mean, this is such a big difference between that ugh, yes. and here, which is beautiful. Yeah, our old center was in the uh, basement of the Lafayette Parish Courthouse. Uh, it was uh, really old, uh, no windows. Uh, the equipment we had was probably like 25 years old and it was just really time for a move. Tell us about where you were before this, your previous room, and then a little bit of the process to come down here to this floor. Uh, we were on a different floor for 27 years, and we were in a small area uh, with console furniture that did not move up and down. Uh, pretty much was stationary, uh, really no room for expansion. We were cramped. We were not able to add any additional workstations. Next, we're gonna talk about funding. Oftentimes you find out we're gonna get money and we can make this move, or like you're gonna find out, some of these centers have had to save for years and years to get the money to do this. So let's go into the funding and learn how they got money to make these projects successful. You didn't need to get any federal grants or anything. You kind of have your own independence here with funding it yourself. That's correct. We are funded through um, uh, a surcharge, through uh, any device, telephone that can uh, dial 911. And like I said before, you know, many years ago, they realized this was going to be needed and every year would put some money in that future projects fund, waited till they had enough money uh, to be able to fund a building and then began uh, the project. And it just so happened um, to happen in the, the crusp of technology changing. We're talking, um, you know, text to 911, yeah. video to 911. So all that equipment also needed to be purchased uh, for the new building. Well, the funding for the project came from, um, from our uh, telephone uh, search charges that we charge. Uh, we've been saving our money for 29 years to get a bigger, better facility to serve the citizens of Lafayette Parish. Uh, so we saved money all those years and finally we were able to uh, secure the land and uh, start hiring an architect, doing the design of the building, and ultimately we got a, co a construction uh, contractor and uh, we built the building. It took like three years in the design phase, but uh, we're really pleased with what we came out with. So where'd you get funding for this project? How'd that, how'd that come together? Uh, the state of Illinois decided to uh, consolidate 911 centers uh, several years ago, and uh, counties that had uh, four 911 centers had to reduce to two. So we uh, were forced to uh, reduce our centers from four to two, we took on two additional communities and the state provided a, uh, a grant for us uh, for a, a large portion of the equipment upgrades and the remodel. Uh, and then we used uh, 911 funds from the 911 surcharge that appears on wireless telephone bills. So did you put a committee together, uh, you know, supervisors, et cetera, all that, and, and how the, how'd that work and what'd they guide you? What'd they guide you guys to and just how'd that process work with the, with the team? 
Well, our emergency telephone system board, which was uh, the uh, board that pays for uh, the equipment and uh, the remodel, uh, we uh, have a technical committee. So basically, they started with the design, and then uh, we reviewed that design with uh, supervisors and telecommunicators, working with Zybeck staff and, and salespersons. Uh, we were able to come up with the designs and then uh, tweak it uh, with input from the supervisors and the dispatchers. Now you know you've got some money out there, so you need to start shopping. And where's the best place to shop? You're gonna get some tips and ideas on what to look for, tour other centers, go to trade shows. So let's see what they were looking for and what they learned when they got to see all the options out there and get put their hands on it. Tell me about um, how you guys went about learning about your best practices. And I know you traveled a little bit and looked at other centers. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and maybe something that really stood out to you. You're like, wow, that just makes sense. We've got to do that. Um, it was just an accumulation of, of so many different buildings. Um, we, we, we knew that it was important to talk to people that had built buildings and get their experience to do that. So we did. We traveled really all throughout the United States, definitely through Louisiana, into Florida, and talked to as many people as we can, went to their center, and we tried to take what we liked out of those centers and bring it to our center. And of course, we asked the basic questions is, what did you like best? What wouldn't you do? And we you know, kind of used that to see if it would fit our building. And really, this is a, a mesh of everything that we learned uh, over those years and tried to implement that into this building. Well, what we try to do is a design that would fit the needs of our people and our, our uh, territory here. Of course, we very prone to hurricanes, so our building is uh, built to withstand Category 5 hurricanes out there, uh, prone to flooding. We selected land that was uh, not in any flood zones, and we elevated the property also. Uh, we looked at other buildings, their redundancy, their grounding. We tried to take best practices from every center that we saw. So we incorporated all of that into our plans. And of course, uh, you know, our people are our greatest asset. So what we did is we, we asked every one of them, hey, what ideas do you have? What could make your job better, easier? Uh, from the design of the center itself, that we let them uh, select the consoles. Um, and everything else, their break rooms. Uh, so, so all together we made a center that's going to serve Lafayette well and really take care of our employees. So during this project, you knew this was coming up. Did you go research? Uh, what research did you do? Did you go to other centers and walk around and, and kind of try to get the best practices from them? Yes, I communicated with a lot of uh, folks in the 911 uh, arena around the state of Illinois and communicated with them on the furniture that they had. Uh, what the pitfalls were, what uh, what to avoid. Uh, we did visit a few 911 centers. Uh, COVID uh, curtailed some of that, but we were able to get a lot of detailed pictures and a lot of ideas of do's and don'ts of what we should do in console furniture. After you've looked at the options that are all out there for the console vendors, what are some lessons learned from others? What did they do first? What did they do second? Did they do something special with their layout? You're going to see a real creative layout from Lafayette Parish down in Louisiana. So let's see what we've got for that, and you can learn what they learned to get better for the whole process. Tell me about um, how you guys went about learning about your best practices. And I know you traveled a little bit and looked at other centers. Um, so tell me a little bit about that and maybe something that really stood out to you. You're like, wow, that just makes sense. We've got to do that. Um, it was just an accumulation of, of so many different buildings. Um, we, we, we knew that it was important to talk to people that had built buildings and get their experience to do that. So we did. We traveled really all throughout the United States, definitely through Louisiana, into Florida, and talked to as many people as we can, went to their center, and we tried to take what we liked out of those centers and bring it to our center. And of course, we asked the basic questions is, what did you like best? What wouldn't you do? And we you know, kind of used that to see if it would fit our building and really this is a a mesh of everything that we learned uh, over those years and tried to implement that into this building. And what else do you have that's kind of unique in this building that we you wouldn't see say where I am from in Colorado, yes. right? Well, we uh, of course have a kitchen uh, in addition to 911 with the Office of Homeland Security for Lafayette Parish. So uh, during any type of disaster or potential disaster, uh, we activate the Emergency Operations Center. So we have to prepare to sustain ourselves for like two weeks without any services. So we have water, we have MREs, we have a full-size kitchen that we can cook, we have commercial appliances. 
Uh, in addition, um, we have dormitories where our people could stay here and sleep. Uh, we have showers and everything else and a washer and dryer. Uh, so that way our people don't have to travel in any type of inclement weather. And when tropical storm force winds start hitting the coast, we bring them in. They stay for the duration of the storm. So, uh, so wow. we're, we're prepared that way. We have uh, emergency generators. We have two of them. Uh, we have a 450 uh, kW diesel generator, and we have a 450 kW natural gas generator. So uh, full redundancy um, in our building. What else did you see that kind of caught your eye out there? Well, I think the color options, uh, the way that the monitors are mounted and the way the CPUs for the computers are mounted and, and how that's all done as far as serviceability, uh, warranty uh, and uh, that sort of thing is also a big deal. And who's going to fix what may not work or what needs repaired is all very important. We did our research on um, you know, vendors that provided consoles very early. And the first thing we wanted to do was find out who had the good reputation. We talked to people uh, that had different types of consoles. Obviously, when we went to these, these centers, we asked them about their consoles. What did you like? What didn't you like? Uh, what was important to us was the service that was available for those consoles, because you're correct. There are a lot out there. Um, once we got the size of the room, uh, then we started talking with different vendors on what kind of concepts they could design for this room and really the model that was designed here our 911 operators did that we we engaged them and said what would be best for you every everyone has something different every center is a little different and they designed um this structure and one of the reasons that um that we liked zybex was the way you were able to work with us um, you were going to design whatever we wanted, but you also along the way gave us your own ideas and best practices uh, to be able to do that. And looking at everyone, uh, it was the obvious choice and one of the best choices we made um, for our center. I can definitely tell you everyone that comes here comments on the, um, the consoles and how they look and once we give them a demonstration on how they work, uh, they're very impressed. This part is about the RFP process. Some centers have to go through an RFP, some don't. There's a state contract available, there's funding available. So let's learn how they went through and made the decision if they have to go to RFP or if they don't go to RFP. So let's sit back and watch this. So you had to go through the RFP process uh, for the consoles, is that right? That's correct. We, we put out an RFP for the consoles and so we got a lot of responses and we looked at that, we graded them all the same. And you know, once we finished all the grading, um, you know, Zybex was uh, the top one, and then we actually began negotiations w with Zybex, mm -hmm. and uh, this is what the outcome was, and we're very pleased. So tell me a little bit about the, our portion of this here at Zybex. So we, we ended up providing you guys with the dispatch furniture, um, and I know, gosh, we talked to you guys like three years ago, and I know you guys did your shopping, and you had to go to RFP, right? So talk to me about the kind of the process there and how it worked for you here in Lafayette. Yes. Well, what we did uh, for the, the console positions, it's very important that our 911 operators have all the tools that they need to do their job. Yeah. So the consoles, uh, that's their little home when they're at work. So we tried to get all the features that we thought would make them ergonomically comfortable. We uh, went to several trade shows. We looked at several different manufacturers of uh, furniture. We did an RFP. We had a team that, um, that evaluated all the RFPs. We had our people look at them and look. Uh, we love the quality of the Zybex. Um, I think we purchased every bell and whistle that they could have and uh, we're very, very pleased. It's one of the best purchases that we did for this building. You managed not to go out to bid on this RFP process. Uh, tell me a little bit about that and your, your motivation on that because everyone has to do a little bit differently. Yeah, um, we as a committee don't really or didn't know and still don't know about console furniture. It's not something that we deal with every day. So we uh, basically gave the, the basics of what we needed, the layouts. And then uh, we had all uh, the companies that uh, we felt comfortable with it, then provide pricing to us. And we were able to do it through the pricing or a buying group that our county was comfortable with. For me, the most important part of getting a new updated room, a new center, anything like that is without a doubt getting the layout right. We're going to talk to them about 
the interaction that went between them and the Zybex team and how they spent a lot of time talking and getting it just right. Involve your team, involve the people that need to be there, get everyone working on it. This is the most important part, just getting it in there right. If it's not right, you're probably gonna regret it in a couple of years and it's a lot of money to move stuff around. So let's see what they did. Let's really pay attention to this section. I like this layout because you know you guys did it a little differently. Um, and I like, so you've got your, your supervisors in the middle and then your support staff on the outsides and you've got more supervision going in the rooms there. But I like how you did. You have the curve stations out here and they could work together, but then the supervisors are on what we call our straight station in the middle. Real creative layout. I mean, I gotta give a hat tip to your people. I thought I've seen every layout out there possible in the past 20 years, but they came up with something new that I'd, I'd recommend to somebody else. They did. Uh, any center that we went to, we did not see this layout. And um, honestly, I was a little apprehensive when they came up with it because when it was something new, you know, you look at it, but the more we studied it and the more we talked to them, um, this center is for them. And so they were very confident and adamant that they thought this would work the best and so that's what we went with and obviously after the fact we're very pleased that we did yeah and i love what you call it the open concept we're starting to see more of mm -hmm. that and they did that similar over at york and i just did it i was in, down in lafayette louisiana and they did a similar mm -hmm. setup and i was like oh this is this is clever yeah some people think it's a little loud that way but i'd rather have the open where everyone can hear than not hear yeah because i've always seen it where you know you get a call of a vehicle accident everyone's calling that sees it Mm -hmm. So everyone's on the phone, and not everyone, if they're not able to hear other people, they don't know if they're all having the same call or not. Yeah. So what's the, what, what do you think the hardest part, what is the hardest thing to pick out in this room? Um, what was your biggest decision to make in here? Um, probably, probably the furniture, because okay. that's, that's the most important for our people. Um, you know, we have CAD computers. Well, uh, everybody has, you know, we have CAD, and CAD is very important in here. Uh, the monitors and everything else, but it's it's what our people are going to sit in and operate from. Um, we have the uh, the heaters, we have oh, the yeah. task lighting. Uh, a lot of people like to stand, so we got the um, the consoles that they can stand or sit, and we were very surprised that a lot of them stand half the day. So um, so. I think that was the hardest to pick all the different features that we knew would fit them. You worked with our designer, Emily, mm -hmm. and um, tell me about that process. How's that work? Because that's one of the most important things, I think, is getting the layout right, and it's also a lot of fun. Um, so a little bit of pressure on there, a little bit of fun. Tell me about the, the process. Well, once, once you know how many consoles you, you're, you want to have and have available to operate, um, then it was it was a matter of do you want straight consoles do you want them curved uh, those kinds of things and uh, then basically uh, once the space was known and what we were going to have available as far as the floor plan then uh, Emily and Heather then worked uh, together with us in order to be able to put that space uh, in its most effective means. How'd you pick the color scheme here? Uh, the color scheme, we really limited the number of folks uh, that reviewed the colors uh, and we decided we had a small group of folks um, that really uh, picked the colors that were available and uh, we decided to go with uh, this particular uh, color scheme. The next part is why did you go with Zybix? It's interesting where people see the value that Zybix provides them in one place or another. So we're going to learn how that happened and why they went with the Zybix team. So what are the, what are like the top two reasons you went with Zybix? Um, I think the top two was the durability that we um, received uh, from people that had Zybex um, and actually uh, the workability that we, information that we received. Um, number one from people that had it saying that um, the way Zybex worked with you, how professional they were and that's what we found out when um, we actually started engaging with Zybex and we wanted to design uh, this system in this way. They were very engaged with us. They got back with us very quickly. Um, they showed us the design we needed. We kind of, we had the vision and we could draw it out ourselves, but Zybex came in and they showed us exactly what it would look like, exactly the colors. That really hit home with us and, uh, you know, really made that final decision. You ended up picking Zybex, obviously. So the process of picking a vendor, how'd that work for you? You know, some places RFP, some don't. You know, what was your rules on this? So our rules are we wanted to try to pick a good product. And uh, we've had some of the competitors' products for years. 
And we went and took some field trips and looked at some recent Zybex installation, and we were very impressed with it. In fact, when we contacted you know, our sales rep, I think she was pretty amazed when she came in to meet with us, sat down with her, and uh, she was kind of explaining the whole process and how long this was going to take. And we pretty much told her we only had a few months to do this from, stop, from start to stop. She kind of left here with a look of amazement on her face, but we quickly found out that there was a state contract and a federal contract that we could purchase off of. And I've got to say, one of the biggest things that you can look at when you're doing something like this, find someone else that has already bought and has an open contract that they went out to bid on or they've purchased something and you can buy off of that same contract. That kind of cuts out 30, 60, 90 days worth of time on a project. So we were able to buy off of a off of a GSA contract, and Zybeck honored that contract with us, and that again took about 90 days off of our process. Next here, we'll go into a little more detail on why they went to Zybeck. I'm asking questions for them of how did their salesperson or the designer help them, and hopefully this give you guys an idea of what you can do to take advantage of the team we have here. We got awesome people here to help you out, and we want to help you. We like serving you guys. So let's look at this, see what we have to say, learn from it. So throughout the process, you had, you had a couple different uh, account managers, um, but you ended up with Brittany. And uh, so how did she help you through the whole thing? Um, you know, what did she do that you know, made life easier for you guys? Um, she listened, uh, and really I think she started understanding what we were trying to accomplish, and she was very responsive. Uh, you know, when we needed something, she got back with us very quickly. And we changed several times, um, whether it was the color or fabrics that we needed for that. Um, there's a lot of choices, and um, we asked her and Zybex to put a lot of different combinations together because it wasn't something that we knew just by describing it or looking at samples. We asked Zybex to put it together for us, put these colors together for us, and then we, we even asked them, what do you think would look together? And they would come back with ideas like that. So that type of interaction and working ability between us and them uh, is really uh, made a big difference. What was your best part of working with us here at Zybex? I think how um, function like how you're able to adapt to everything. Like we have the columns, and I, yeah. Yeah. everyone was like, "Oh, columns!" But you were able to work around it, and we didn't lose any space in that. There's not dead space at all. You utilized all of it around there. Yep, yep. That was tough. And our, uh, between Therese and then the engineers, I was really proud mm -hmm. of what they did on yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. And then our layout, our wall is a little off, so you guys were able to make that work too. Yeah. And then your account manager is Maria. Um, mm -hmm. Tell me about working with Maria. Oh, other she's than, great. Other than she's a lot of fun. Yeah, she's a lot of fun, but she also helped us out like with the color schemes and everything because it's one thing to look at the little, you know, cards. It's another thing to see it in action. And, you know, so originally we had for the front of the cabinets, we had a different pattern. And she's like, that's going to look horrible. I just know deep down it's going to look horrible. So she said, go with the black. And we're like, okay, we'll go with the black. Yeah. And that was a good decision. <laughs> okay. So you worked with uh, our VP of Field Operations, Kelly Smith, on this? Yes, worked with Kelly. He was a very squared away. It helped that he uh, came out of a comm center yeah. because when he came in, he understood what we were doing. He understood the urgency. Some of the vendors that you work with, you have to, you have to go in and tell them, oh, this is why we can't go down. And no, you can't unplug it. And then if something has to go down, it needs to be at 3.30 in the morning. But Kelly understood all that right from day one, so that made it uh, that made it a very fluid situation. Uh, we probably shaved two hours off of our first face-to-face -face meeting just because he understood all that stuff. So we could stipulate that and just move on. So uh, Maria's job for you guys was kind of keep this on schedule. And I remember a phone call coming in. She talked to me. She's like, "We got to move on this. A lot of these jobs are, you know, nine, ten, twelve months. They, you know, they kind of plot at the pace of government." So how did Maria help you out that? Was that, was her keeping the pace? Maria kind of kept us on task. Uh, we had milestones that we needed to achieve and she had milestones that Zybex had to achieve. So she kind of was the go-between uh, between us and Zybex. And to, to be quite honest with you, when you buy something that's this large and so many, uh, so many moving parts, it takes an enormous amount of coordination and without Maria in here, I, I think we'd probably still be trying to put it together. Yeah. So the other other teammate from Zybex that you worked with is uh, Emily Houston, your designer. Uh, we like to give people one designer for the project um, so they can learn each other and do well. So tell me a, bit, a little bit how, how it was working with Emily and what she did. Because I saw some unique stuff in your room that I think turned out really well. 
um, and she's always up for the challenge. So t tell me a little bit about working with Emily in the design process. So ours was a two-step process, three if you include a, a third jurisdiction that bought the same time that we did. But on our first phase, we used Emily, and I'm going to tell you, she did a fabulous job for us. Uh, she was very innovative, and she listened to what we said we wanted, and then she let us know what they could do. So we not only learned from her, but she learned from us as well. And uh, interesting, you open up by saying you try to keep the first one. Well, you weren't successful with that. We had a separate designer for the second one, and we were kind of worried about it because we had established a working relationship with Emily. And then the second phase, we actually had a separate designer working with us on that, and she picked up the, she picked up the slack and rolled right on with it. So Heather is your account manager on this project. Um, tell me how she helped you through the whole process. Yeah, Heather was uh, outstanding. She provided our point of contact, uh, was very responsive, uh, and basically answered any question that we had. And uh, if she didn't have the answer, she knew who uh, at Zybeck could get that answer. We've all watched those shows on TV where someone comes in and remodels the house for free and then they do the reveal. Well, sometimes the center does something like that. Not the free part, but the reveal part. So it's dispatchers, when they first walk in, how does that change their attitude? How does that make them feel when they see this center for the first time and they walk in there? Really exciting. So let's hear what they have to say from their own words, how they felt when they saw their new furniture for the first time. So how do you think your employees feel when they walk in, when they come into this new building? Uh, from their reaction, I really have to say they love it. Um, they love all every aspect of it, specifically coming from the basement of the courthouse, which was commonly known as the dungeon. Yeah. And... Um, when you have low ceilings, very tight, uh, the, the consoles, everything was very outdated, they were older. Obviously, we were saving money, there was no reason to, you know, refurbish that and do that when you were going to come to a new facility. Um, I can tell you some of the things that I noticed that they really love about these consoles is the consoles raised and they can stand up. When yeah. you're sitting or you're at a position, let me say, for 12 hours, that being able to stand up and change your posture um, and then sit down when they want. So I've noticed they, they, they stand up a lot. I, I'm watching TV, I see these remodel shows and they come in with the big reveal. So tell me about that. Was that a rewarding moment for you when, you're, you, when your dispatchers walked in here the first time? Were they, what was the reaction? Well, they were very impressed. Uh, they were very happy with the, uh, the facility, the color scheme, the, uh, the additional room that they had. Uh, they're thrilled that they're able to stand up or sit down at their console, whichever they choose. Uh, we also have one, have one console with a treadmill, so they're able to, to walk on that for a period of time and be able to utilize that and get a little bit of exercise. We're getting closer to wrapping this up. We're just going to do general tips and advice that they will give you. So there's some just quick videos in here where you can pull some points out there to help you make sure you're steering this in the right direction. Do as much research as you can in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, go visit centers that are, that are new centers that uh, you think may be innovative. Um, uh, call them, get information from them because a lot of the the technology or even the, the nuances that we have here, we were able to go to other centers, uh, we saw what they had, we took pieces that we thought that we liked and that would fit us and we were able to install that here. Very importantly, you know, we talked to our, our operators. Um, this configuration is really their design. Uh, I haven't seen it anywhere else and if I would have designed it, I would have designed it something that I've seen before. Um, they designed it uh, they believed it was work. They know their workflow, and they knew it was um, what they thought would best fit them. And so I would do all of those things, all the research, talk to your people, uh, get their input, get their advice. And all along the way, whether it was the color, I think we engaged them. We wanted them to be part of it. We wanted them to know this is your building, this is your center. So we always got their, their input uh, and their opinion. So what advice would you give somebody that's got um, a remodel like you did coming up in the you know, next six or 12 months or something like that? What, what would make it go smoothly for them? Now you have the advantage of you guys could go over to York and do yes. this, so move out of the room, stay in the room, what do you think? I think it's probably better if you can leave and go to another center and that allows the designers and everyone to get in here and do what they need to do and you're not in the way in the sound too. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're drilling and walking around and heavy footed and I mean they're, the consoles are heavy all that sound can go across the phone or the radio and we didn't have that problem at all. What tips would you give somebody else that's in this process? So they're 
three years out or maybe five years out and they're like, oh, we're starting to get money for a new building, um, not just the furniture portion of it, but the whole building. So what tips would you give them to make their team work together for this? Well, it take you to your time and design. Involve your whole staff. Everybody has unique ideas. Everybody brings stuff to the table. So um, that, that's our big take. We, we went and we saw the best practices. We brought them back. We wrote them down. We took pictures. And when we met with our architects, we said, this is what we would like to see. And we tweaked it along the way. So, um, you know, it's a work in progress. But I think, uh, I think we did a pretty good job in addressing all of our needs. And uh, we built our center for a 25-year growth. So we have uh, a lot of storage. Uh, a lot of centers are here. That's one of the mistakes they make. They don't have enough storage, and they're in the building for three years, and they're out of storage. So that's one we, uh, thing that we took into consideration. Um, we have to have our PPE, our meals ready to eat, bottled water, um, mask, gowns, stuff like that. So uh, we took our time in the design of it. Uh, we want to make sure that it was a safe, stable building. We have um, exercise equipment for our employees. Um, so we just... Uh, Take your time in your design. Think about your everyday operation and, and what you do and what can you improve. Advice to other centers that are going through this, whether they're in Illinois or just anywhere else in the U.S., um, what would you tell them, like top two or three things? Uh, trade shows are very important. I think you need to, to work the floor and, and talk to the vendors and find out exactly uh, about the product, how quickly they can deliver the product, what the warranty is, um, the layout, the time, that sort of thing. Uh, and then communicate with your neighbors and other dispatch centers that have went through recent remodels and really listen to what the pitfalls uh, and, and good things were for, the, for their remodel. Now we can't wrap this video up without why they went with Zybix and would they recommend Zybix. We work hard for this. We work hard from the very beginning from that first sales call. The design team works hard for you. The installation team works hard to make sure it's done on time and it's everything's right. And our customer service team works hard for you also. So let's see why they'd recommend Zybex. Uh, we definitely want to thank you and, uh, and Zybex for working with us and oh, yeah. helping us, you know, make this center what it is. You're definitely part of it. Uh, when you walk in here, this room is one of the ones that uh, gets the most compliment and that's all they see when they come in. This is, this is you're here. You're part of us. Thank Perfect. you. Yeah, thank you. So would you recommend Zyvex to yes. other centers and why? Definitely, because you guys worked with us. I mean, it didn't matter what time frame we had. Um, anytime we had to schedule a meeting, Maria was right there to get it done. So, you know, work with us, being a 24-7 operation, she was able to be very flexible with that. And same with Therese. Something unique Zyvex is doing, we want to wrap this up with, is we've been providing free, no cost, recruitment videos for centers. We understand, and you'll hear the quote in there, that staffing is the number one issue. And we understand that. So we've been providing professional recruitment videos for centers so they can increase the chance of getting good people in there working and be fully staffed. So let's learn a little bit about these recruitment videos. So we're, we're trying to shoot some recruitment videos to help centers out that bought Zybex recently because we know staffing is always a difficult part. So Maria told you that we're doing this recruitment video. What do you think of that? You know, I thought it was pretty, uh, pretty intriguing. We have been looking at budgeting for a recruitment video for years, and it's always on the wish list, but when you get down to the short straw it's, uh, and you're short on money, that's one of the things that yeah. gets cut. And we have our own production company here uh, within our government, you know, that does board meetings or that type of thing, and we've always had it on their list to come in and try to do. But uh, we thought this was a pretty intriguing idea, and uh, we look forward to to see what kind of product you're going to deliver. So uh, Heather called you up and told you we're doing these recruitment videos um, mm -hmm. at no charge. What do you guys think of that? Well, our number one priority is staffing the center fully. So anything that we can do to showcase uh, our emergency communication center and uh, the outstanding work that our telecommunicators do here day and night uh, is something that we were, were very eager to be, to be able to do. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you learned something about the remodeling, updating, or even getting a whole new building for your 911 center. The interviews you watch are just short sections of full-length interviews we did with directors all across the country. If you'd like to see the full-length interview, let us know. We'll be happy to get them to you. And as always, if you've got any questions about remodeling, updating, furniture, or just anything Zybix in general, hit us up. We're here to help.
some great tips, some great advice from people in the field. Uh, a lot of times in projects like this, we talk a lot about the equipment. We think a lot about the consoles, obviously, like we said earlier, the CAD, radios, phones, but sometimes we forget the people. If you've got a project coming up, it's important to think and plan in advance because change, even, even something you look forward to, can be very disruptive to your team. So this little video that I put together here from Zybex really focuses on your leadership and how you as a director, as a leader of, of a team, can use the project to increase the culture and really create lasting positive change for the culture in your center. So enjoy this nine minute video. Hey everybody, this is Doug Herman at Zybex. I appreciate uh, taking just a few minutes here at the end to talk to you a little bit about leadership, but specifically, we're gonna talk more about change management. How do you lead your teams through these projects and how do we really manage that? So I've got a short presentation that I've uh, developed from you. It's from a training that I got at Acuity Institute where I got certified as a change management uh, certification. Also, it's where I got my Lean Six Sigma Black Belt certification as well. So, um, Real quick, we're going to go into this presentation and uh, just kind of look at change management and again, the byline, overcoming resistance to change while gaining buy-in for your employees and leadership. So before we really start talking about the change, I want to talk a little bit about kind of where we are in, in our society as a backdrop. We've noticed, and you guys have noticed, especially in your industry, that society has gone through a change uh, and some unrest. All right, there's a backdrop. You, we're finding people who are really angry for whatever reason. There's just a lot of anger going on, and there's a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I think we need to we need to really look at a few things that come through the the under the underlying issues, right? So some of those are just some of the pain that people are going through. Uh, those can be found in feelings of inequality. Um, like, I just don't feel like it's fair. And if I see inequality, then I feel like I'm not going to be treated fair. So that causes pain and fear inside of me. Um, people who don't want to be alone, isolation. And what do we do? We quarantine people. So we quarantine people. We isolate them. We don't let them be with anybody else. And that causes a fear of aloneness and loneliness. And it feels an inequality kind of bubbles up. And all of this stuff comes up and hits anger and anxiety. Uh, and that's just kind of a general where I've, I've seen and what I've heard, just a general feeling in the, in the country today is just that sense of unrest. Well, if that's the backdrop, then we're going to go into a project and you say, look, we're gonna, we're gonna disrupt our, our, our center. We're gonna go through a major remodel or a build and it's gonna be crazy. Um, this, this is where we're headed. So what does change or disruption do? How does that disrupt your team? How does it disrupt the people? And we have to manage this as leaders. We have to make sure we're doing a really good job of doing that. So I'm presenting today something called the change curve. Uh, it's also known as the J curve in projects. So in the change curve, everything starts, as you can see, it starts kind of typical and with the neutral. Uh, there's initial excitement. Yay, we're getting new furniture. It's going to be great. We're going to get a new center. It's going to be so awesome. And then the project starts, and there's a little bit of like numbness, don't really care. It's happening. Just ignore it. Just keep moving on. Uh, and I'm kind of feeling this a little bit by the way in my personal life because we're doing a major kitchen remodel in our house. So at first it was great. And now we're going into, I'm in the denial stage. Um, and my wife is experiencing Doug, me, going into the resistance stage a little bit because now I'm a little frustrated. I'm tired of picking out details. But your team will go through that frustration. Um, they're stressed out a little bit. There's a lot of change. And whenever you go through change of any kind in your life, there's something they call the valley of this, of despair. So the VOD, the VOD, and you'll, you'll find this valley of despair. You can pull out of it, but that's what we want to share with you today is how do we get people, when we go through a, a disruptive program that changes everything, and some people love change, but some people just hate it because it, it, it disrupts so much. Well, there's a couple of ways, and these we're going to go in depth a little bit more here in a sec, but... First of all, we have, to, we have to do something to get them to stage five here where they're exploring. It says they're energized, creative. They're overworked but excited about it and increased commitment. Some, you're finding small wins. 
to where finally we get to the end goal, which is commitment. And they're excited, they're enthused, they're solving problems, they're working as a team. So that's where we want to go. How do we get that? Well, let's dissect this a little bit. First of all, there's going to be natural resistance, as you saw in that earlier slide. There's a stage of resistance. So there's going to be a little bit of that. And the human brain always registers change as pain. So if you look, it's in, it's in the human brain, uh, in the cerebellum, where, where it's, you experience change and your brain doesn't like it. It's not safe. It's just not the way that we were uh, either created or evolved. So we're just not, that's not who we are. So what happens is you find people in the Valley of Despair or Pity City, and the, what you have to do is really start exploring issues of hope and um, vision and action. So getting people involved with action, sharing the vision. This is what it's going to look like if you have drawings or pictures of what your center is going to look like. This is how we're going to work together. This is what we can do for, for holidays now. we got a, a kitchen, whatever, these kinds of things where you're, you're sharing the vision of where you're at to really start pulling them through that process. When, when you see resistance, this big, bold line is, is true. Embrace it because you are disrupting what's the status quo and you're bringing it into something new. You're bringing the group into a new product or project. So you have to really embrace the resistance. Here's three simple steps to do that. First of all, acknowledge that it's there. Um, I like the first bullet. Be comfortable with your own discomfort. It's okay that you're uncomfortable. Um, it's going to be uncomfortable for a while. We're going to be out of our desk. We're going to be working at the backup center. We're going to be doing a live cutover. So it's going to be, there, there's going to be a little bit of chaos. Even though our installers are fantastic, it's it's going to happen. So embrace it, right? Listen to people and then identify the reason. Say, what's up? Why is it that, that you're kind of feeling like you don't want this? I'm, you're going to get heaters and air conditioning on your desk. It's going to be great. So sometimes it's like, well, it's happening to me. I'm not really a part of it. Change, not, this is not my choice. This change is not my choice. You can talk through that and then develop a strategy to deal with the resistance. How do we, how are we going to do this? Let's talk about that. Let's learn about it. Let's work together. Let's trust each other. Maybe I can get you involved and get you in and involved in the process. So th three ways to manage resistance, really uh, put those strategies together and acknowledge it and identify what's really causing that. If you put your effort in up front to manage the, the resistance, this is the effort chart. This is how much implementation. If you start right away and you put the effort in, it just says effort gained, required to gain commitment. And the second one says effort required to overcome resistance. And I'll just read this at the bottom. It says, it may seem like a majority of the effort for change happens up front, but that is no coincidence. The more effort you put in up front to acknowledge the resistance, and you identify the source, understand where it's coming from, and you address it earlier, then the less effort's required to overcome resistance later. What we don't want to do is start and let it just surprise, and then we start to put out fires and deal with problems. Instead, let's really put a plan together and say, hey, this is going to be this disruptive. It's going to be a challenge, and let's, let's know it's coming and make sure everybody has a chance to communicate and get through it. So that's important that you really start in early. Quick wins are ways that you can also help bring change. And I wanted to include this slide a little bit because when you're doing, when you're transforming your center or your business, um, you want to do some quick wins. If you just do in case one, there's really no short-term wins. You did some transformation. The change was good for a while. And then it just flatlines and the business doesn't change after a while. And you've seen that in businesses and restaurants where you've gone. Initially, they change your menu. It's great, but nothing else really changes. But if you have case two, it's like, well, you get some change in the business, but you're going to find little wins all the way along. But they kind of peter out after a while. The best is case three. Let's get the, the transformation of your center. Let's find some short-term wins. Let's get some groups together. Let's talk about decorating. Let's do, do some, maybe we can do some wellness competitions. All these little wins are going to keep transforming the culture in your centers. And you can leverage your project to begin to, cha to change the culture and just begin to build it. So it's not just buying furniture. It's doing a transformation for your entire team. You have to sustain that momentum as well. So in any continuous improvement program, you got to remember that it, change happens in sprints, not marathons. So you have to really begin to do this in, in short plans, these quick wins. You get momentum and you sustain it, right? So, and, and like the third bullet is real clear, just the, don't count those chickens before they hatch, right? One of the biggest mistakes is de people declaring victory too early. So John Cotter in Leading Change says this, don't let up. Press harder and faster after you have the first successes. Be relentless with initiating change after change 
until the vision is a reality. So just keep pushing on and creating new change and leverage the success that you have. So change management, again, just in summary, it's real simple. Overcoming resistance to change uh, while gaining buy-in for your employees and leadership. We understand the backdrop before that we are in beforehand. We recognize the change curve. It's a process. We're going to embrace this resistance. We're going to find quick wins wherever we can, and we're going to keep using them over and over, and we're going to sustain that momentum. We're going to keep this going. So it's not just a project, but it's a series of changes that can that can occur, and uh, we can see those changes changing our culture. So I hope that that was beneficial for you. We'd love to, to connect with you some more. Um, so reach out to us here at Zybex. If you have more questions about this, I'm more than happy to reach out to you as well and give you some support and encouragement. Have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon. This is the stressful part. All right. Well, thank you for the people that watch this video. Um, I hope you learned a little bit about this. We're trying to put together this nice package for you so you can learn from the professionals. Um, this will be available at Dare to Be Great. It's also going to be available on our YouTube channel, and it's also going to be available on our website. So thank you very much from Heather and Doug. We appreciate you guys spending time with us, and we'll see you guys at the next Dare to Be Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody. Thank all right. Thank you very, very much. Um, excellent, excellent production for one. That was very nice. And uh, just everything that you that you have put out there is it. I think back to the, uh, the twenty five. I'm pretty sure it was the twenty fourteen um, National Nina Conference out in uh, Nashville, and it was the first. Um, major one that I was at after dispatch and I remember going there and I believe um, it was uh, it was Kathleen back then um, I, I was out there and I was walking around and I was asking her questions because the first thing I, I noticed was the um, the treadmill that was attached and I remember her saying come on just everyone they're so friendly and everything is just come on come on and uh, and get on so I was walking and I was like I could do this I could do this while you know on radios or something in dispatch and I ended up having her on an episode during that time as well just learning about everything that you all were doing so um it's been awesome just from that time all the way till now everything that's going on and uh you know everything that you're designing implementing and putting out there um you know there's some nice discussion that was going on in the comments and people saying what they were looking for and what they love about it and i just i love that you guys were in the comments and just talking to everyone so thank you so much you're welcome yep thank you and uh, for those who are, are watching and, and uh, either you're watching right now or you're watching on uh, replay, of course, make sure to uh, hit up that uh, Discord community. There's a lot of people who are in there talking and uh, sharing a bunch of information about the sessions. And make sure to go to withinthetrenches.net slash conference and uh, hit up the sponsor page. You'll see uh, Zybex in there for our silver sponsors. And click on their company page. You'll find out more information about them, each one of them as well, in their bios and such. And then the session that they did as well and there are some marketing materials there as well that you can download so make sure to go and check that out because by supporting our sponsors you're supporting us and we wouldn't be able to do this without them so thank you all so very much and uh, we'll see you all in the next one all right yep. thanks ricardo